We are ready to begin our study portion for today's broadcast entitled Commands of the Messiah, Part 2. So we are in the second segment now of a long-running, hopefully, study series entitled Commands of Messiah. This study series, we are, our, our aim is to examine each of Yahshua's commandments, study them in fullness so that we might more effectively walk as he walked and live as he desires us to live. Now, in the previous segment, we, uh, we talked about um, repentance. We talked about rejoicing in trials and persecutions. We talked about do not think he came to destroy the law. And now we're going to talk about the need to be more righteous than the Pharisees. And uh, a lot of people think, well, man, the Pharisees, boy, they were just perfect law keepers. If, if, there were, if you were looking for someone that was going to keep the law, they would have done it perfectly. And I've heard this so many times from well-meaning traditional Christians um, that see, the Pharisees, you see, they could, they kept that law, man. They knew that law backwards and forwards. And, and, um, and they still were not good enough. And if you're trying to go back to live under that old law, then really it's not going to be enough. Not going to be enough. And uh, you need to be more righteous than the Pharisees. Right here, that scripture says you have to be more righteous than the Pharisees. And they, man, they had the law down. Let me say something about that. Anyone who tells you that does not know what they're talking about. They simply don't know. They are flat out wrong. They were not law keepers at all. Nowhere close. The idea that they are really good at keeping the law is actually quite far from the truth. The scribes and Pharisees were sadly characterized by Yahshua himself as wicked, vipers, bloodthirsty men. They were pretenders. And so while the multitudes of Yahshua's day were fooled by their pretending and considered these men to be the elite, the truth was they were abominable men. Now, I'm not saying every one of them, but an overall characterization is this. Luke 6, 16 and 15, he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But Elohim knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of Elohim. When Yahshua was addressing them in John chapter 7, verse 19, he said, Did not Moshe give you the law? Yet, how many keep the law? How many of them kept the law? None. He said, Not one. They were not law keepers. They were law breakers. They were not righteous men. They were wicked men. Absolutely. Wicked men. And we have to recognize that. Because on the basis of them people supposedly being righteous, a lot of the people in the first century rejected the teachings of Yahshua. And on the basis that these men are being righteous, a lot of 21st century people think that, well, see, not good enough, so don't keep the law because you can't do it anyway. He says, not one of you, none of you, keeps the Torah. They're trying to kill him. How can you claim to be keeping the Torah when you have when you have murder on your mind? You can't be. It doesn't make any sense. Okay? And these were the men that ultimately did end up sentencing Yahshua to death falsely for blasphemy. He also said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay tithe of Annas, Mint and Annas and Cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. What are the weightier matters of the law? 
contrary to what you may have heard, justice, mercy. Yes, mercy is a part of the Torah. And faith. Faith, mercy, and justice are not only part of Yahweh's Torah. They are among the weightier matters of the Torah. He said, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Both gnats and camels were unclean. Both were forbidden and are forbidden to be eaten. Okay? Well, they were busy getting the gnats out of their, their wine or their salad, but then swallowed an entire camel in the process. In other words, yeah, making sure they got the mint tithe and the anise tithe and the cumin tithe, but just pass on by justice and mercy and faith as if it's nothing. In fact, the Pharisees didn't even love Yahweh at all. He said, Woe to you Pharisees, for you tie the mint and ruin all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of Elohim, which is the greatest commandment in the law of all. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He's not faulting them for tithing of their mint and their rue and the manner of herbs. But don't swallow a camel by passing by justice and love of Elohim and the mercy and the faith. So these men were not righteous. Stephen, the first martyr, in fact, he said of them, he said, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. They are betrayers and they are murderers, who received the Torah by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Period. They were not law keepers. They were law breakers. Murderers do not walk in justice, mercy, and faith. Stephen even told them they hadn't kept the law at all. And so they were not these perfect little law keepers. They were pretenders attending to the finer points so that they might appear to be big-time law keepers while neglecting the weightier matters. And so it's important. We have to be more righteous than them. We can't just look on the uh, things that make us look good and pass by mercy and pass by faith and pass by true love of Yahweh. And so it's true. They did believe in keeping the Torah. Scripture says they didn't come close to keeping. In fact, they omitted the weightier matters. And so we have to be on guard. If you pay attention to all these finer points, but then neglect true love for your neighbor, true love for your wife, true love for your children, true love for your community, all your tassel wearing and feast keeping doesn't mean much of anything. Now, the idea the Pharisees were law keepers kind of comes from this impression that some have that the law of Yahweh is just concerned with the outside, the external, and not matters of the heart. And so they believe the Pharisees, oh yeah, they're keeping the law because they're keeping all these external things. And for this reason, they say, Yahshua had to come along and give us a better law, a, a Torah 2.0 that was based on the heart and the spirit of the law. They say he had to internalize it because it was all external. Another false teaching. That is not true at all. Not even close to being true. So we're going to get to our next point. Beware of the danger of anger. 
Yahshua said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry, whoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, meaning a, basically a stupid person, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, for someone to be a fool means that they are not a believer, basically. Okay? Whereas someone being a, a you know, rock, I just, just don't have any sense. That would be someone just in danger of the council. But the thing is saying someone's not a believer, they're a foolish person, then they're in danger of hellfire. If it's without a cause. If it's without a cause. Yahshua called people fools. Fools and blind. And uh, so, this is not a new idea. What Yahshua is saying here is not really new. A lot of people think, oh, he come with this brand new teaching. It really wasn't new at all. Remember back in the book of Genesis chapter 4 and verse 6, Yahweh said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? So, right away, the first warning about danger in Genesis chapter 4. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Rule over your anger. Rule over the sin. And so Yahshua's commandment is simply a repeat, really, of what was written before. Cain was angry with his brother without a cause. He was in danger. Abel did nothing wrong. He simply walked in righteousness and lived his life in a way that pleased Yahweh. Yahshua, likewise, did nothing wrong, but simply walked in righteousness and lived in a way that pleased Yahweh. And I think that's the reason why it was the first thing out of his mouth. He says, you've got to be more righteous than the Pharisees. Because like Cain, they hate my righteousness. They're angry with me without a cause because they're envious. They're jealous. Same thing with Cain. Envious and jealous. Yahweh warned Cain about his anger and where that would lead. Judgment. Yahshua warned the scribes and Pharisees about their response to Yahshua's righteous acts. When he looked around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But what happened? Were they rejoicing because this man had a restored hand? They were, No, they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Yahshua. Murder. Murder is not far behind. Can we see Cain likewise was in danger of condemnation. They are angry. With, he was angry without a cause. Anger leads to murder or at least the spirit of murder. The spirit of murder has to do with harming the other person in some way, either through so insults or to slander. Scripture says in Psalm 37, verse 8, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. There's only harm. Just harm. Likewise, Yahshua, he was warning about us about this danger of anger. He says, Whoever is angry without a cause is in danger. Anger might cause someone to hurl an insult, like a stupid person or a foolish person, but scripture says actually the one who is exhibiting anger is the one actually exhibiting the folly. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 says, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. So the one who is the angry one is actually the one imitating folly. And so with their anger, with the judgment they judge, they are judging others. And so Cain, 
Obviously, he hated a righteous man without a reason. Murder was the result. So don't call each other names. And probably one of the more common areas where I hear people calling each other names is parents toward their children or brothers and sisters toward one another. Don't think because it's within the family construct that somehow you're exempt. Or husband toward a wife or a wife toward a husband. Don't be calling each other names. Now, she was said, basically, this is what the anger is going to lead to. It's going to lead to this. Violation of one of these commands here. You should not go about up about, about as a talebearer, a slanderer among your people. Nor should you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. That's basically taking a stand against their life, their well-being, by bringing insults, by bringing uh, accusation by causing other people to think badly of them and causing them to be rejected in the community. That's taking a stand against your neighbor's life. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. Oh, I thought the law was all external. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Not at all. It says, you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Go to the person. Go to them. Some have the impression, old Levitical law is all external. Look at this. This is about what's going on in your heart. There was no other nation on earth that had national laws that governed a person's heart. Nowhere. Only in Israel. Because their king knows the hearts of men. And so the kingdom was established upon a heart-inspecting law. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor. Don't bear the sin because of him. Don't bear this. Don't carry this. Go to him. Talk to him privately. Right? That's what Yahshua said. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This whole love your neighbor as yourself, straight out of the Levitical law. That's Levitical law, brothers and sisters. Some people think the Levitical law is all, the Levitical, Levitical law is done away with. Really? Love your neighbor as yourself is done away with? Don't hate your brother and your heart is done away with? Uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. People just don't know. They need to know the scriptures. They just don't know. So Yahshua was not giving us some new commandment. He was repeating the old Levitical law. Even warning us about being judged for violating that Levitical law. He said that judgment and hell were not far away if we're prone to treating people this way and acting this way. Don't bear a grudge, which is basically bitterness. Don't avenge, as in get back at that person, evil for evil. And don't hate them in your heart. We have to be on guard against anger. Proverbs 19.19 19 says, A man of great wrath will suffer punishment. If you rescue him, you'll have to do it again. He's hooked on anger. Such men are they're hooked on anger as a way of resolving slights that they have in their hearts and they pile up they pile upon slight upon slight upon slight until they just got this big old ball of bitterness in their heart and they can't seem to control the anger that comes out of it it's tough it's a tough tough thing to break because it's seen as a manner of self-protection and the sad thing is, it works. People are often intimidated and controlled by a person's anger. Especially if it's their family members. Or if the guy happens to be a real big guy. Or if the lady just is so extreme in her behavior, everyone just goes, okay, lady, whatever. 
just don't want to have to deal with that, you know. So, you know, these are, this is a major, I mean, anger is a major issue in the hearts of a lot of people, a lot. And, um, and we have to find a way to respond in a different way. We have to find a way to respond different way. Now, Scripture says, angry without a cause. When Yahshua said, angry without a cause, what is a just cause for anger? And sometimes this is the biggest problem. People think, well, I have a cause, and so I'm going to be angry. And so they justify it. Righteous indignation, they might call it. After all, the other person, they were not acting righteously. Doesn't Yahweh also get angry and want to execute vengeance at times and wrath when people are doing wrong things? Doesn't he get angry when wrongs are committed? And so I will do what I perceive Yahweh would do. James and John thought the same thing. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. It came to pass when time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and set messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him. Why? Because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Master, do you want us to command fire to come down out of heaven and consume them, just as Eliah did? But he turned and rebuked them, said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. See, they thought they were operating in the power of Yahweh's Spirit. They were confident in their righteous indignation, believing that they, by the power of Yahweh's Spirit, even could command fire to come down out of heaven and consume the Samaritans. The reality was the Samaritans and the Jews were continually at odds with one another. And there was probably a little bit of self-centered motive there for wiping out the Samaritans. Likewise, we are just as susceptible to assuming that we are expressing righteous indignation when really we're just angry and vengeful. Really, it's an unclean spirit leading us. And Yahshua would say to us, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. How can we know the difference? It can be very difficult sometimes to know the difference because a lot of times our own heart will deceive us. Scripture says he who trusted his own heart is a fool. And probably a lot of people that are walking in the folly of anger are assuming their own heart is correct in the matter and they're justified in their anger toward another person. But whoever walks wisely would be delivered. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So the hearts of James and John were tested and tried, and it was revealed that they were being led by demons instead of Yahweh's spirit. So then what would Yahweh say if our hearts were tested and tried? While we justified our anger, as being righteous indignation. It was wrong for the Samaritans to reject Yahshua, especially on the basis of going to Jerusalem, which was the city Yahweh had chosen. But the response of James and John were also wrong. It was not the time for vengeance. The Samaritans were simply deceived and were probably reacting out of their own hurt out of their own anger due to their rivalry they had with the Jewish people. You don't end the vicious cycle by responding hurt for hurt. 
just like a lot of relationships today. It's not really until somebody chooses not to avenge, not to do evil for evil. It's not until someone says, I'm going to take the high road. I'm going to show love in response to your hatred of me. I'm going to give a blessing in response to the way you've hurt me. I'm going to respond with the kindness of Messiah Yahshua rather than the unkindness you've shown to me. That's what Yahshua came to do for you. Not to destroy your life, but to save it by expressing love while we ourselves were being hated, hateful and hating one another. There is a time for Yahweh to express his vengeance, but James and John were not properly discerning the time. They were not willing to be patient with the others. They were operating in the wrong spirit. And it is when we are feeling rage within us that we're probably most susceptible to operating in the wrong spirit. And there were times that Yahweh actually did use his people to fulfill his vengeance. Don't get me wrong. And the spirit of Yahweh can influence a man to express anger. Ezekiel 25, 14, he says, I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. That they may do in Edom according to my anger, according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the master Yahweh. In that case, Edom was ready for and ripe and ripe for vengeance. And in Saul, 1 Samuel eleven six, 6, the spirit of Elohim came upon Saul. When he heard this news, his anger was greatly aroused from the spirit of the Most High. So we have to discern what Yahweh is really doing on the earth right now. Before Yahshua came, Yahweh gave Israel opportunity to establish a righteous nation, a nation that could be a light to the world judging unrighteousness, cleansing the earth of evil. Yahshua came to be the king of that nation, but he was not accepted by his people. And we are now in a time when Yahweh is calling sinners to repentance. He's coming to save men's lives, not destroy them. We have to have his discernment, his understanding, his spirit, and a willingness to allow Yahweh to expose our own prejudices, our own unclean motivations. And we need to be certain that we are not misapplying Scripture, which speaks of Yahweh's vengeance on his enemies, while we ourselves fully expect to be completely forgiven and have no vengeance poured upon us for our own sin. Somehow, when you look in the mirror, it's a whole lot easier to not be angry. If we're feeling the emotion of anger welling up within us, it's time for self-inspection. It's time to look in the mirror. It's time to ask ourselves, is this really from the Spirit of Yahweh? Or is it out of my own frustrations, my own impatience, my own stress, my own wounds from people who wounded me in the past. Is it really because of Yahweh or really is it because of me, 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 that I'm upset at this moment? Is it, become, is it really because I'm so spirit-filled I'm getting this from His holy, righteous, loving spirit? His patient, gentle, kind spirit? heart-probing questions, brothers and sisters. And so whenever we see righteous indignation, really, it's usually toward the unbelievers. I mean, David says, Do I not hate them, O Yahweh, who hate you? Wow. David hated people? He says, I hate them, O Yahweh, who hate you. And do I not loathe those who rise up against you. He says, I hate them with a perfect, perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Why? Because they hate Yahweh. Then he says, 
Search me, O Elohim. Now it's time for a little mirror inspection, right? He just expressed his hatred. And now it's time to stare in the mirror for a second. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. You see what David did with his anger and his hatred? See, David hated Yahweh's enemies, but you notice right after that he wanted to look in the mirror. He wanted Yahweh to show him his own heart to see if there was anything wicked there. And so what I'm hearing David say is, I have this hatred for your enemies, O Yahweh. Search me out to see this is from you or from my own anxieties and from my own wickedness in my own heart. Lead me in the way of everlasting life. And I would say this, David, by the Holy Spirit, could know, could know who among men were of such a reprobate mind that they would die in their sins and they would never give their hearts to Yahweh Most High. And so it was safe to hate men such as those, the ones that will never love Yahweh and permanently have rejected the love of Yahweh and absolutely 100% are going to hell. But do you know that? Do you know who's who? Maybe Yahweh can show you by his spirit, but dangerous place to be, the danger of anger. It's recorded in scripture, Yahshua once, I think once, maybe twice, someone might argue, got angry. But he never hurt anybody with it. The earlier scripture, where the man had the withered hand, he entered the synagogue again, and there was a man with a withered hand. This is the man that we read about was healed earlier. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. He said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. He knew what they were thinking. And so he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good? or to do evil, to save life, or to kill. But they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with what? With anger. Being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Now, there's two things I'll point out here. One is, a lot of people say, you should never be angry on the Sabbath because you're kindling the fire. Well, this is a Sabbath, and Yahshua had righteous indignation. You shouldn't have anger at any time unless it's righteous indignation. Righteous anger. Yahshua's anger was not based on self-centeredness or some wound he was carrying. It wasn't because of something they were doing to him personally. It was from what? It was from grief. Grief because of the hardness of their hearts. Out of sorrow, their hearts were so hardened, so obstinate, they could not see. It was Yahweh doing the healing here, guys. And if Yahweh didn't approve of the healing, hello, the man would not get healed. But they were so envious and so obstinate, their hearts were so hardened. And they wanted so badly to find some fault with Yahshua so they could kill him, so they wouldn't have to deal with him. That they wouldn't turn to him. They wouldn't turn to Yahweh. They wouldn't humble themselves. And so he wasn't grieved because they had some personal vendetta against him. He was grieved because their hearts were hardened. Yahshua did not allow personal slights to result in anger. Okay? And that's the, that's the kind of stuff that happens in, in, in Genesis. Oh, take vengeance. Take vengeance. Yahshua, yeah, scripture says, do not take vengeance. You shall not take vengeance. Well, if you're going to do this to me, 
But I'm going to do this to you. That's taking vengeance. I actually know somebody one time. They kept quoting Yahshua's word. Well, Yahshua said, do unto others what others do unto you. No, that's not what he said. He said, do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. Okay, now getting angry and vengeful over personal grudges and bitterness is not a just cause, brothers and sisters. The day will come when Yahweh will pour out his wrath on the heathen nations. And these men, these bloodthirsty, hateful, reprobate men, yeah, there will be wrath on the men one day. But when he was on the earth, he understood it's not time to show personal vengeance. He didn't appear as a wrathful, vengeful, or angry, angry Savior who lashed out at others who hurt him or insulted him. Instead, as Leviticus 19, 18 teaches, he showed love, he showed compassion. Matthew 23, verse 33. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand, the other on the left. And Yahshua said, what? Pour out your wrath upon them for all this stuff they're doing to me? No. Get him, get him, Yahweh? No. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and they cast the lots. He didn't lash out. He didn't avenge. We're called to walk in his steps. Yahshua takes the beatings and the spittings and the mockings and the ridicule. He says, Father, forgive them. And we receive one little bit of disrespect and we lash out like we've been slain. That's not what we're called to. To this you were called, 1 Peter 2.21, because Messiah also suffered for us, giving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. He committed himself committed himself to him who judges righteously. If you think vengeance is yours, you're wrong. Vengeance is Yahweh's. He will repay. Yahshua not only refused to avenge, he actually asked Yahweh to have mercy on them. And so Yahshua and his disciples practiced this principle to not choose unjust anger, and to not use insulting words toward one another. Now I have a full study on the topic of overcoming anger. If you go to Elliot.com slash overcoming anger, you will find three studies on this topic based on Leviticus 19 and others uh, that can help you if you're having struggles in this area. May Yahweh fill us over the repentant hearts with a willingness to be controlled by the spirit of Yahweh and not our emotions and not our heart wounds. Now, in this same scripture of Matthew 5, Yahshua also warned against hurling insults and, and things that could result in judgment for ourselves. I actually have a full study on Lashon Hara, the evil tongue, Slander, Eliad.com forward slash slander. So moving on to the next commandment of Yahshua, which is kind of related to this one. Don't make an offering if there's an unresolved sin that you're dealing with. Yahshua said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come, offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly, while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. 
being clear of sin in the eyes of Yahweh before making an offering is something very important for us to remember. You might wonder why it would be important for us to remember because we don't have an altar that we go and make sacrifices, right? But we do. First, let me explain the proper order of things. We know David, for instance, he did some pretty awful things. He committed murder. He committed adultery. He had done with this with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. And so Yahweh convicted him of his transgression. Well, after he got convicted of his transgression, he didn't just walk down to the tabernacle and start offering sacrifices on the altar. Instead, he said this, Psalm 51, 16. He said, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of Elohim are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O Elohim, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering, the whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls in your altar. And so when a person's heart needs to be clean, they need to repent of their clean, of their sin, and not think that I'm walking up there with animal sacrifice, I'm not going to make up for the condition of their heart. Now, how is this violated today? The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Yahweh, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Isn't there scripture that says, let the lifting up my hands be as the evening sacrifice? Yes. And so if someone wants to come and make a prayer offering to Yahweh, they have to have their conscience clear. They have to repent of their sin. Isn't the songs of praise, lifting up your hands and songs of praise, an offering as well? Actually, that pleases Yahweh more than, than animal sacrifices? And so if we have unresolved sin that we have committed toward a brother or toward a sister, and uh, we just go on about like nothing happened and um, offer our prayers and offer our praise offerings to Yahweh, it's not good. Go and be reconciled to your brother. If at all possible, live peaceably with all men. And by principle, looking at the spirit of what's being said here, I think that we need to think about this in regards to our feast days as well. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our mighty one, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Says Yahweh, I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? You're walking into my presence and you don't belong here. You rulers of Sodom, you people of Gomorrah. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons, Sabbaths, calling of assemblies. Why? I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. He cannot stand it when we're walking and living in sin and we've made peace with our sin and then we go and keep these feast days. We go to our, our assembly gatherings, lifting up our hands in praise to the Father. And in the rest of the week, we're living in sin. Yahweh says he cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meaning. He cannot stand it when we are walking in willful sin and then go offer this praise to him. 
It just doesn't. It does not work that way. And so what Yahshua is teaching us, he's, saying, he's pointing us back to the way it was supposed to be, not coming up with some new thing. If you want your, your offerings of praise to be accepted, because Yahweh doesn't have to accept your offerings of praise at all. And so if you want that offering of praise and you want your prayers to be heard and to be accepted, we cannot live in willful sin. We cannot be living in sin, and we know it's a sin, and we don't care that it's a sin. We keep on living in it. We cannot live that way. We cannot know we hurt our brother, and we know he has something against us because of that, and then praise Yahweh on the Shabbat. He didn't accept the offering to praise. Could be reconciled. Get that sin dealt with. And I'd suggest if you have other sins, sins concerning your own relationship with the Father, you know you've sinned against Him, and you're not living right, and you've made peace with the sin that you're committing, and you don't have any plans on changing. Don't even go, unless you're going to repent on your face. Don't even go to services, unless you're going to repent on your face and ask Yahweh to forgive you and confess your sin. Right? Now, the second thing he said about, you know, agree with your adversary quickly. Actually, that's not new either. Um, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 1 says, My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you shake in hands and pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So you did something you shouldn't have done. So do this, my friend, my son. Go and deliver yourself. For you come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter. And like a bird from the hand of the fowler. Again, Proverbs 25, verses 8 through 10. Do not go hastily to court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbors put you to shame? Debate your case with your neighbor, and do not disclose a secret to another. Lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation be ruined. It's better to settle things personally between you and one with whom you've offended. Go to your brother and try to make peace whenever you can. Humble yourself if you've wronged him, so that Yahweh will accept your offerings of praise to his name. Very important. All right, and the final one, do not lust in your heart, is the next command Yahshua talks about. Interesting, he's talking about some very key things. Number one, you got to repent. Number two, don't be like the children of Israel in the wilderness and whine and moan and complain about the trials and persecutions. In fact, he wants you to be happy about it. Don't even act like the children of Israel in the wilderness as if the law of Yahweh has no force. And don't be, if you're going to be religious, if you're going to follow, you're going to follow me, don't look at their Pharisees. They are not no example of how to follow me at all. And then he, he addresses three major things. Anger, unresolved sin, and lust. These are major, major, major areas. Very, very common problems among us, brothers and sisters. Yahshua said, You've heard it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, actually, this is kind of an old favorite, you know, by various preachers of mainstream churches and and very often quoted by the New Testament only teachers to prove Yahshua had internalized the law by giving these new and improved commandments. And they like to say he was teaching this new covenant way of life with a brand new law, a better law, saying the law is in your heart now and so 
Now we're focused on making sure that we're not breaking these commandments in our hearts, see? And that's part of the new covenant, they say. And by quoting this, they claim the old covenant was merely the old way of external obedience, and the new law is a new and living way. For the law is in your heart, and so he requires obedience in the heart too. And for that reason, they say, we don't keep external commandments like you know, Sabbath keeping and feast keeping and ceremonial things, you know. We only concern ourselves with the heart. And if they would only pick up and read and study what they call the Old Testament, guess what? They would not say that at all. In fact, they would find the law of Yahweh written in stone, a commandment that governs the heart. Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. What's it mean to covet? It means to desire. Just don't have a desire for anything belonging to your neighbor. Not his house, not his wife, not his male servant, not his female servant, not his ox, his donkey. Nothing that belongs to him are you allowed to desire. You can't lust for your neighbor's wife. You cannot lust for her. That's lust. That's what that is. Coveting is lust. It's just, it's not an external commandment, even though it's written in stone. It's a commandment that governs the heart. Yahshua was teaching nothing new. Anyone who lusts after a man's wife is violating one of the Ten Commandments and is walking in sin. Now, Job, he said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? He knew where it started, where the eyes go, right? So he wouldn't look at this word translated young woman has to do with uh, virgin women for, you know, like additional wives. Nope. He had one wife. And if he lusted after another one, he said, what is the allotment of Elohim from above and when the inheritance from the Almighty, of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked? Disaster for the workers of iniquity? What did Yahshua say? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? He knows what's going on in the heart, right? He knows. And so he says, he made a covenant with his eyes. Right? And so, Job was married. He would have made a covenant with his wife to keep himself only under her for as long as they both shall live, very much like most marital covenants today. And so he was not thinking of having another wife, and neither was Abraham. He was ready to die childless until his wife says, well, you can go into my handmaid. Right? So he was honoring the marital covenant he made with his wife. And we see Job recognizing Yahweh doesn't just judge what we do. He judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Job was a man who probably lived before the Torah was ever given. And so this is not some new teaching Yahshua was bringing forth. It has been, always been wrong from the book of Genesis and onward. And this is actually an area where a lot of brothers and sisters, especially brothers, struggle. In fact, years ago, I did a full study on this topic. And I actually did a poll, and I asked everyone to anonymously answer the questions. I didn't know who the answers were. I didn't know who who submitted their answers. Um, and it's anonymous poll, and I asked the brothers and the sisters. I said, as um, first the males, I said, as a male believer in Messiah, do you struggle with lust? when you see an immodestly dressed female. 
7 out of 10. Among us, people that believe in keeping Torah, believe in following Yahshua, believe, yeah, 7 out of 10 are struggling when they see an immodestly dressed female. And then I thought, well, I wonder about the women. So, as, as a female believer in Messiah, do you struggle with lust when you see an immodestly dressed male? 17%. Almost the reverse here. Um, but 17% said yes. 83% said no. Which this really kind of speaks to the way Yahweh created us. Where men are more visually oriented and women are more emotionally oriented and more relationship oriented. So even those of both genders. So then I wondered, okay, we know that homosexuality is a major issue in our culture today. I wonder how many of those, if they do struggle with lust, I said, this question, if you do struggle with lust when seeing an immodest person, do you ever struggle with lust when the person is of the same gender as your own? 12% said yes. I appreciate their honesty. And probably a lot of that in that 12%, their first exposure to these kinds of activities uh, of something to do with um, being violated when they were a young person by someone of their own gender in all likelihood. But I think back to David. Here's, here's a man after Yahweh's own heart who saw an immodestly dressed woman and it even caused him to fall. And so I don't really think that the 7 out of 10 here, the 7 out of 10 are disloyal people that don't care about Yahweh. And uh, the fact that you're saying, I struggle, is honest. It's good that you recognize a struggle. And uh, it's not uncommon but it's never justified to commit the sin of lust. Never. I don't care if she's walking down the street with no clothes on and she's the most beautiful woman you ever saw. Doesn't matter. You have no excuse. And she has no excuse for her sin either. Walking down the road with no hardly any clothes on is basically being an agent for the devil to cause men to sin. In the case of Bathsheba, she was bathing, probably innocent. But David, perhaps having a larger home and maybe having a vantage point from the roof of his house that other homes in the area would not have had. Pornography basically brought David down. Second Samuel 11.2 said, It happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the, the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And so here's David, a mighty warrior of Yahweh. He could defeat the Philistine giant with a single pebble. He could defeat the army by the power of the living Elohim. He was loyal, a man after Yahweh's own heart. But even this man, otherwise great man, fell because of lust toward a woman who was immodestly attired this case, wearing nothing. So the problem that he had has serious consequences. It was transferred to his firstborn son, Amnon, who couldn't resist the temptation to rape his own sister, Tamar. And his other son, Solomon, had the same problem. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 2. It says, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Medemites, Sidonians, Hittites, 
From the nations whom Yahweh has said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their mighty ones. Solomon clung to these in love. Just like his father. He has 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart after other mighty ones, and his heart was not loyal to Yahweh, his mighty one, as was the heart of his father David. So Solomon was heart, his heart was loyal to Yahweh, but he had this issue with women. He didn't have to fornicate, he just married them all. <laughs> See one you like? Oh, want to get married? Uh, okay. Who's going to not get married to the king? Most of the women said, yes, I'm pretty sure. Up to a thousand, but he had the money to do that. Imagine having a thousand wives. You can only visit each one, I mean, so often. Maybe one every three years. It was ridiculous. It really was against the Torah. It says, do not multiply wives to yourself. And it all started, one man in his eyes, in a secret place where no one knew. He was looking. Just like what we have. These little devices in our hands, brothers and sisters. Go off in the bathroom somewhere. Who's going to watch? Who's going to know? Yahweh. Now I'm bringing up this example because we see immodesty can be a very, very powerful tool of the enemy. And so ladies, if you truly love if you truly love, seek to understand what true modesty is because you're not going to be able to understand it. You're just not. You, you don't most likely have any of that. So you're just not going to understand it. We live in a world full of Bathshebas. And perhaps they're not complete without clothes, but a lot of times there really isn't much difference. I hope we see the serious consequence of one man's family a mighty man at that. I once asked a, a group of teenage girls, I says, do you love boys? Oh, yeah, yeah, we love boys. We love boys so much. If you really love boys, you're going to care about their relationship with Yahweh. Right? Well, yeah. And so you would do everything you could to make sure their relationship with Yahweh was in such that they wouldn't be going to hell and that they would be able to walk in obedience, right? Yes. That's why we teach modesty. Because if you really love boys, you'll cover up. And you'll seek to understand what modesty really means. And I know, those of us who are trying to be people after Yahweh's own heart, we live in the immodest world. And this is one of our greatest enemies. And for women who don't understand, look, have you ever... You ever been hungry? Went near a restaurant, you know, and maybe a mall somewhere, and you smell donuts. You smell cookies. You smell, this smells really good, and your stomach just goes, you know. Okay, now suppose there was a command in the Bible that says you're not allowed to desire what they're baking. You can only eat the cookies that your wife or your husband, you know, your husband makes. You can't like them other cookies. You can't like those other donuts. Don't smell it. Don't, 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 don't enjoy it. You must cover your nose when the aroma comes. You cannot. That's what it's like. Maybe even worse because one of the greatest drives a man has is that drive. And it's far more powerful than a desire for cookies, I promise you. Uh, but Yahweh expects us to manage it and to only direct that drive toward the one that we are married to. And this is a major test of loyalty. Really, it's a major test of whether we're going to keep the commandments of Yahweh or not. And it is possible by the power of the Holy Spirit and a belief it's no longer we that live, but the Messiah living in us to overcome these things. And we don't have an excuse. We don't. 
where we should not touch with our eyes, which we're not allowed to touch with our hands. We should. We had no business investing our eyes and thoughts in a place where the rest of our body is not biblically permitted to follow. The only time the rest of our body is permitted to follow is when we're married to that person. And so the only time we should allow our hearts to lust is when we're married. 1 Corinthians chapter 6.20 says, You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are Elohim's. Look, brothers, sisters, we need to see life on earth today is just a tale of two kingdoms. And it ain't no fairy tale. It's real. What I read in scripture is that we are called to look at things spiritually, not just physically, look at spiritually. And what I read in scriptures is a powerful realization. There is a war going on. There are two kingdoms battling for supremacy, a spiritual battle taking place between two forces, good and evil. And we who've chosen Yahweh's side, look, in spite, we understand in spite of glitz and glamour, the evil side is not what's cracked up to be. Evil side sells you acceptance. It sells you happiness, but leaves you with depression and sadness and a lack of peace. And those who've chosen Yahweh's kingdom see the enemy's side as something to battle against, something to fight against, to which we have put on the whole armor of Elohim, being able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood against principalities and powers. This is an attack from the enemy. What you're looking at, brothers and sisters, is an attack from the enemy. So fight against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Take up the whole armor of Elohim that you may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand. We are in the battle, whether we know it or not. We need to understand quite clearly. Everyone, everyone, is in the battle. Everybody. We have to have our armor on every day. And there are no better things to be wearing this age than that armor. Because we live in a perverse and adulterous generation. And the enemy is so, so very subtle and so very able to deceive. And too many of us have been desensitized to his ways. And we're not nearly as sensitive to what's going on in the spiritual realm as we should be. And we don't realize that a battle is raging right now. When that woman walks by, when that person walks by, a battle has just begun. But we've been so Grecianized and Romanized, we don't even realize it. I think it's time we think biblically, hebraically. Be sensitive to what's happening in the spiritual realm rather than being desensitized by the enemy's devices. Yahshua taught us imagination and the eyes should not go where our hands cannot legally follow. And from Yahweh's perspective, whatever we do in our hearts, in his mind, it's already been done. And so our relationship with Yahweh and the idea of marriage he set in motion as a law of the universe. His law binds us. We don't have to fight. We don't have the right, I should say, to extend our hand where we don't have permission to go. And in, our, in Yahweh's eyes, what we imagine is every bit as important as the rest of us. What Yahweh imagines, he creates, and that's all a good thing. We're created in his image. We're expected to do the same things with our imaginations. Keep them at bay. Any use of my creative capacity to imagine things have to be righteous. If I'm gaining sexual pleasure from a person I'm not married to, that is an evil imagination and thought of the heart that must be addressed. Evil imagination is essentially how evil comes in this world to begin with. It's where it all starts in the evil imaginations of men's hearts. So even if you only permit the evil to exist in your mind, it's still damaging to the world we live in and to yourself. 
Yahweh's way is that the marriageable women are first shown love, then valued enough to take into betrothal and marry with a promise to love, to serve, and protect. And only then can one gain that kind of pleasure from her. And even then, the pleasure is supposed to be mutual. Not one-sided. Now, from the woman's perspective, she should not be gaining that kind of pleasure from a man she's not married to. It works both ways. But usually, it's the men that have the greater problem, as we saw in that poll. But what we do in our heart has to be righteous. Has to be righteous. Genesis 6, 5, Why did Yahweh destroy the earth with the flood? He saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. Continue. Because the heart condition. Zechariah 6, 7, 10 says, Do not oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Zechariah 7, 8, 17, Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. Proverbs 3.29, do not devise evil against your neighbor. He dwells by you for safety's sake. Now, when a man engages in lust, he not only violates the right of the woman he's choosing to gain sexual pleasure from, he's also defrauding that woman's father, who's not given permission for him to gain anything from his daughter. First, first Timothy or First Thessalonians four three says, "For this is the will of Elohim, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know Elohim. That no one should take advantage of and defraud." his brother in this manner because Yahweh is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified and so you're taking it you're, you're you're taking advantage of your brother defrauding him because you're taking his daughter without permission in your heart you're defrauding him. Exodus 20 verse 17. Uh, says, I'm sorry, first, first line is fourth, seven through eight. For Elohim did not cause uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he rejects this, does not reject man, but Elohim, who has given us his Holy Spirit. So, lust is essentially covetousness. Coveting your neighbor's wife is exactly what Yahshua was addressing right here. That's what he's talking about. All right. The same, actually, same Hebrew Greek words are used for both, just so you know. Same Hebrew words are used for both. Now, Scripture says the about the importance of con contentment. For, in Philippians chapter four, verse seven: Not that I speak regarding me, as I've learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. To be content. All right, so for us to desire that which we do not or cannot obtain, if we are married especially, we should choose to be content with A, the wife that Yahweh has provided, or B, the wife that Yahweh will one day provide for us. And we don't know who that is yet, but you must be content. If you're unmarried, be content to withhold that intense craving that rises up in your members until there's a proper place for it. There is a proper use for it, and there is a misuse for it. If it's towards someone you're not married to, it's misuse. If it's towards someone you're married to, it is proper use. The desire itself is not evil. It's something Yahweh put in us. But if it belongs to an or directed toward another person that you're not no rights before Yahweh to use it toward, then it's wrong. Now, even when you get married, you're going to have to control it. 
because there will be seven days out of 28, approximately, that you can't do anything with her. And so this is going to be a lifelong thing that you're going to have to find a way to manage, even when you get married. Because we practice what we do, believe it's right to practice, which is a commandments regarding Nida, when she's in her monthly uh, cycle, then there's seven days, hands off. Well, you can hug her, don't get me wrong. You can't have your relations with her. Okay? So, it, it continues to go. I mean, you have to continue to control it. Uh, and there'll be times where, you know, I'm not going to go into details, she may not feel like it. So you're going to have to learn to control it. All right. Now, for those who are willingly displaying parts of the body that only your husband is supposed to see, I have something to say. You may not realize it, but you are imitating Satan. Because Satan is always trying to get men to sin. He may not be trying to, but you're being a willing accomplice for his purposes, and you're being used by him to tempt people to sin. Now, there are certain parts of the body that should be covered. And there are certain parts of the body, like the face, which are perfectly fine to uncover. A person's face is in public view. The parts of the body related to nakedness are the parts that is only supposed to be for one's spouse to see and to enjoy. It's not wrong to acknowledge a woman happens to be attractive in her appearance. Even the Bible says someone was attractive in their appearance. But as long as there's no discontentment with the state that we are in, because that person is not our spouse or we are not desiring that person for ourselves, uh, we're fine. Okay? And so how should we as believers treat those who are sisters? As men. Scripture says, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger as, as sisters. Younger as sisters. With all purity. All right. Look at them as your sister. As if it was a, a sister in your own family. Hands off. Don't even think about bad stuff. And we know, Scripture says, it's wicked for a brother and sister to see each other's nakedness, right? Leviticus 20, 17, if a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it's a wicked thing. And they should be cut off in the sight of their people. He's uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his guilt. You know, you can uncover your sister in the face nakedness, with your heart. If you're to treat the younger women as sisters, you have no business undressing them with your heart or beholding their bodies as if they choose to be, you imagine them to be unclothed. And so, if you want to love your wife, the wife that you will one day marry or the wife that you're married to now, practice purity now. Practice loyalty to that future wife now. Love that wife right now by keeping your heart pure and keeping yourself only under her for as long as you both shall live. If you're in the habit of, of lusting now, don't assume it's going to go away when you get married. Don't assume that. Yahweh intended there to be one man, one woman, and for that time together, to be an expression of love for one another. And out of that love for one another, a new life is created. That's Yahweh's plan and will for mankind. Anything outside of that principle is walking in a spirit of fornication, a spirit of fatherlessness, a spirit of adultery. And we have to be on guard against it. Now, I have a full study on overcoming temptation, Eliot.com. 
forward slash overcome. We'll be talking about that next week quite a bit. We'll study on modesty and dress. Eliad.com forward slash modesty. Of all that Yahshua commands, actually this may be one of the most challenging for many of us. I recognize that. But listen, brothers, sisters, listen. We've got to fight. For the love of Yahweh, fight. For the love of your wife or women, your husband, fight. Be a warrior and fight. Don't be like David and let others go out to war while you sit home and look at your porn. Fight. A lot of times in pornography, those women are harlots. They are. And do you not know your bodies are members of Messiah? So I'll take the members of Messiah and make them members of a harlot? Absolutely not. Don't do it in your heart and certainly don't do it with your body. And sadly, some of the women in pornography are actually being trafficked. Some of them are probably even underage and are being forced and abused. You want no part of that at all. Fight. Yahshua endured so much for us, brothers and sisters, just so he could show his love for us. He fought off every temptation out of love for us and for his Father in heaven. And he wants us to do the same for him and for one another. Because listen, this world's all temporary. All that beauty is going to fade. For no sooner has the sun risen with burning heat than it withers with the grass. Its flower falls, its beautiful appearance perishes. And the rich man also will fade away his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved... He will receive the crown of life which Yahweh has promised to those who love him. It will all be worth it in the end. We don't want to be among those who pass away with the world. We want to be among those who receive that crown of life which endures forever. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it's of the world. And the world is passing away. And the lust of the world is passing away. But he who does the will of Elohim abides forever. We want to abide forever. And therefore, we must pass this test, my brothers and my sisters. We must endure to the end. And it'll all be worth it. Almighty Yahweh, creator of heaven and earth, thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Yahshua, for your love for us and showing us the way to overcome and delivering us out of temptations. Thank you for setting a holy example. Help us to walk in that example and possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. But Father Yahweh, we need your strength. We need your power from on high. We need that faith to believe it's true, truly is true. It's no longer we that live. It's Yahshua that lives in us. And the life which we now live, we live by faith in him who loved us and gave himself for us. And now we want to love you and give up ourselves for you. Show us the way forward. For any man that sound my voice, any woman that sound my voice who's struggling with lust, I call on you to walk in repentance right now before the Father. Confess your sins. And if you think somehow in your mind you've justified any of this, talk to me. And I also pray to the Father to show you the truth. 
For we know there's nothing in this world trading our soul for. You gain the whole world, lose your soul. It's not worth it. Not worth it at all. O oh, Father Yahweh, convict the hearts. Strengthen your people. We know Yahshua is coming for a pure bride that's seeking righteousness, that's confessing their sins rather than living in them and making peace with them and justifying them. May your name be glorified as your people truly become those overcomers and receive the many promises to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. O oh, Yahweh, our Master, you are our reward and our great shield. Be our shield that one day you may be our reward. For truly yours is the kingdom and power and glory and majesty forever and ever in Yahshua's great name. We pray these things. Amen.